our view is that there is a way to simplify all of those expectations. Uh, we have seen um, processes developing uh, in conjunction uh, with our farming leaders the use of farm plans. Our view is that they in the future can be used as a tool to remove a huge amount of administrative burden um, for our farming community. It means that in the future we should be able to remove some of the consenting processes by having integrated farm plans. It's something that the likes of Dairy NZ, Federated Farmers, other farming leaders have called for as a tool to make the job of farming and meeting those expectations that much easier. They're already being used. It's now our job to make sure that we integrate the work we're doing at a government and local government level into these farm plans. To talk a little bit more about how we intend to resource that, I'll hand over to Damien O'Connor. Um, kia ora and thank you. Uh, Thank you, Prime Minister, and, and uh, thanks to all the people on the farm here for hosting us um, and for the calves for keeping quiet. Um, we're, we're on a wonderful farm here, and like many here in the Waikato and all around the country, um, busy getting on with their day-to-day -day work. And we have, as a government, come in with a couple of mandates, and one is to help the farming sector move forward, to get more for what they do, not just ask them to do more. Um, and there have been requirements around, uh, around fresh water, around animal welfare that we've been working with the farmers uh, to improve. And some of that of course comes with a cost, uh, with a regulatory burden and depending on where the farmers are in terms of their cycle of, of developing a farm plan, where the regional council is, uh, there are different levels of capability and capacity. And so we are announcing today $50 million to go towards uh, the development of integrated farm plans throughout New Zealand. Um, we will be working with farmers, with the regional councils and with officials who are working through things like freshwater standards and regulations to make sure firstly we have practical and implementable uh, proposals but that also that the farmers get assistance uh, through expertise in both councils uh, and independent independent farm advisors uh, to help them develop a farm plan that will reduce their requirement to have resource consents in many places. Uh, we went to Southland uh, last week, David Parker and I, and we agreed with the Southland Environment Southland, uh, with Federated Farmers, Beef and Lamb, uh, Dairy NZ, that would sit around the table and work on ha implementation of our freshwater standards. Now that will require some resource. Uh, Environment Southland is well up to speed with it, but there will be other councils around the country uh, that need to get some assistance. So the $50 million that we're announcing today will be for the development of those integrated farm plans that will assist farmers get through all the requirements that they now face. Health and safety, uh, biosecurity, uh, animal welfare, um, all of those things are now uh, a requirement on farm. Uh, some see it as a bit of a burden, but actually if you come to a farming operation like this, most of those things will be covered with the existing farm plan. So we want to use the resource to share that knowledge between farms, between councils and between farm advisors. So I look forward to, um, with my colleagues, um, with the regional councils, to working out um, where we'll spend that money uh, you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Is this an acknowledgement that those freshwater reforms are too onerous? No, they're not too onerous. Um, I think that working out how they implement that on each and every farm is something that we can't write from Wellington. And that's why we want to put the resource on the ground to help people because every single farm plan will be different and it's impossible uh, for us to write those farm plans from Wellington. We do set the bottom lines and that's what we've done. Over the past um, year as well at least, you know, we have had within that farming leadership group that we've been working alongside uh, a real call from them to say, look, these are tools that we are using on farm already. Um, many farms, for instance, who are um, operating with Fonterra will often already have those farm plans um, through, um, through that relationship. The question has been, how can we integrate some of this more recent work um, around water, for instance, into those existing farm will plans? A smaller, will it help those smaller farms? I mean, the bigger um, operations yes. presumably have more resources. But is, is that the it'll, help, it'll help everyone. I mean, if we can create a process that says actually for winter grazing issues, you don't need to go through a separate consenting process. It can all be integrated within your farm plan and that can also cover off a range of other different issues you're already having to deal with, be it health and safety, be it biosecurity. I mean, farmers have a wonderful way of sharing knowledge and information. They call them um, discussion groups or field days, um, but they require some resource to set up. And so what we'll be doing is helping 
those those forums to be set up and where farmers can share that knowledge. Traditionally, farmers aren't I think regardless actually this is the right thing to do. You know, I remember last election having this debate often. My view is that uh, you know, this is the backbone of our export market. There are huge challenges we're facing. We need to continue to show um, that we are uh, operating sustainably, that we have regenerative farming practice, and that is happening. Now our job is to support the community with some of the new asks that exist and just strip away some of the red tape and make it as easy as possible. What do you say to farmers who think that Labor isn't farming? Oh, I've, I've always rejected that, just as I've always rejected this idea um, that they aren't mindful of the environment. They're working the land every day. Often it will be generational. It will be land that's been within their family that they are committed to. My view is we've got the same goal. It's just about how we get there. Are the plans changes pretty sudden for farmers to adjust Look, not at all. I think many of the farmers who will be supplying Frontera, Sinlay, Miraka, uh, Silverfern Farms, they will all have to have farm plans in their drawer already. And, and so for many, it will just be business as usual, although the requirements and the bottom lines that we're putting in place with, with fresh water will require them to bring those plans out and to update them. And I think that's where we're, we're providing the resource to allow them to update their farm plans. Many farmers are already in the space. Mm. No, that's exactly no. what it's working to avoid. You know, our view is that, that this is an opportunity to use something that's already a really important tool on farm to, to remove duplication and even remove some of the consenting process uh, that farmers might already be experiencing. You know, this, this is something that the sector's been asking for and what we're saying is we totally agree. Now, let's invest in it and make it happen. We've, we have been working for the last two years within MPI to try and develop a template um, that takes the best practice from each of those farm plans around the country and puts it into something that most farmers can, can look at, digest and, and actually implement. How do you feel the day after the... Oh. the next government, what is your plan for farming? What will farming look like? Uh, look, look. We, we've laid out a plan to fit for a better world um, that Lane Jager has led through the Primary Sector Council. We want to get farmers to get more for what they do, not just to do more. This is a perfect example, this operation here, of the value they're getting from the milk off this farm um, you know, and, and right into the marketplace. We can replicate that around the country, Fonterra already focusing on higher value in the marketplace. Uh, we think that farming will evolve. But we won't necessarily see the massive increase in production. We want to see the increase in profit for farms. How are you feeling the day after the debate um, back, on the, back on the campaign trail? Yeah, good. Um, actually, last night I achieved exactly what I wanted to achieve, which was to get out our plan, to give voters for that first debate the chance to hear about our policies and ideas for the future. You know, this is a time where people are looking for that certainty. What uh, is our recovery and rebuild plan look like? And um, that's what I believe I achieved. If you you that you a bit flat, do you agree with that? So oh, you no, I certainly, I felt pretty invigorated out there actually. Um, so no, I didn't feel that way at all. But what I would say is, you know, this is uh, one of four. Um, I think probably over the course of the debates, no one will be left in any question as to our style, um, the leadership we bring and the ideas we have. And that's the whole purpose. Well, one of the yeah. questions we last time didn't really speak to mining projects. Do you yeah. think you'll look to address that in the future debate? Yeah, and look, I think often we are, of course, you know, speaking to the subject matter that's, that's brought to us. You know, I would welcome the chance to delve a little more deeply into some of those issues. I do think that's where you'll see significant contrast between Labour and National. I'm very proud of the work we've done to invest in Kohangareo, to increase our te reo teachers in schools, to support whānau order. Uh, and in fact, I'd love the opportunity to spend a little more time talking about them. Jennifer, Collins, really enough, I mean, this, this was one of those big ticket things last election, really boasting this big Māori caucus, yet Māori wasn't mentioned at all last night. Do you think that that should be part of the policies that you were trying to showcase to the country? Yeah, say, so I would you know, welcome the chance to showcase those policies because I'm proud of them. You know, what we've invested into Kohangareo um, was a long time coming. Uh, the Fano Order uh, uh, investment, actually, you look at the work Fano Order have done during COVID 19, it has been exceptional. And for the future of Oranga Tamariki, 
you know, some of those partnerships that are now being dealt with through whānau order, I think will be a model for the future. So I would welcome that debate and I think we'd see big contrast between parties. Judith Collins. Oh, yeah. I think actually what I, my expression there was just simply saying, actually, when it comes to the debates, I'm not sure that that's what voters are looking for. So, um, look, whatever the nature of those debates are, we'll take them as they come. Um, but ultimately, I went in with an approach that I wanted people to hear our policies and what our plan is, and that's what I did. Judith Collins, did you lose that debate? Oh, actually, you'll find from the debates um, since 2017, uh, I have never made assumptions about the outcomes of debates, either way, no matter what commentators have said. In fact, my recollection is in 2017 it got called my way and I wasn't even sure I agreed with that. So I've always left it up to voters to decide. Judith Collins is, me Judith Collins is meeting a man today with a tattoo of her on his thigh. Have you been presented <laughs> with a tattoo of yourself on anyone? Body part. Or do you mean specifically a thigh? Not specifically okay. a thigh, but a body part. I believe the tattooist is from Morrinsville actually, so I probably know them um, in some way. <laughs> Not at all, no, no. Look, it's, if, if he's getting business out of tattooing politicians, then, then fantastic. Uh, personally, I would never encourage anyone um, necessarily to have politicians tattooed on themselves. I feel like that's a risky place to go. Not a bar that you're hoping to make. No, <laughs> no, I would never encourage anyone to tattoo me on their, their person, thigh or anywhere else. The Aussies, the Aussies are flying, the Aussies are flying an unusual version of yes. the Yes. I think actually, to be honest, I'm probably a bit more disappointed um, that they will not concede on Crowded House. They're very defensive still about Pavlova. I think if we're looking for debate, flags probably are the ones that we find least defensive. I haven't seen what's been flown, so I haven't seen how bad a, a mistake has been made, but I'm sure they'll fix it. <laughs> Well, obviously we've already been there. I think $26 million to um, come up with a stalemate was quite enough. <laughs> if, if, if we're going to reignite that debate, yes, I am. <laughs> No, not at all. In fact, you will have heard me talk about some of those areas where we have uh, needed to take extra initiatives to find workforce. MPI, for instance, during kiwifruit harvesting worked really proactively to try and redeploy workforce where we'd seen job loss to make sure that we were then supplying a workforce into those areas where there was shortage. That's the kind of initiatives we want to see. Um, we do have Kiwis without work right now. This is a prime area for us to work together to, to supply that workforce. One that we've talked to said that they would be prepared to pay for all the costs associated with including health checks and security yep. and accommodation. Is that something that you would consider? Well, this is an area where, again, I'd say piling all of that into supporting uh, finding that New Zealand workforce as well would probably go a long way um, to finding uh, those pickers. And we've, we've seen that, for instance, kiwifruit, traditionally quite a low percentage of their workforce were New Zealanders. They lifted that right up this season. Um, they paid good wages. Uh, we engaged in helping provide training and we made it work. And, um, and, but also and, I mean, yesterday we made changes to the working holiday uh, visas so that people who are in New Zealand now have been constricted in what they can do. They've lost their jobs in tourism. They can now move around the country to places like um, horticultural areas where there is a shortage. So that's about 11,000 people that we estimate at this point who can move into those jobs. Same plea from sheep farmers for sharers. They're saying that they're a group that hadn't been included in the recent um, categories and could potentially create an animal welfare issue come January. February. Is that something that you would look mm. at to yeah. fill that gap? Sure. Uh, when it comes to sharers, it's fair to say that's an area where we're still working through some of those issues. We do have a population that will sometimes move offshore um, into Australia and be part of sharing gangs there. Uh, and so that's something that uh, Minister O'Connor is, is still working through. So we haven't yet concluded the way to res overcome some of so those it's issues. Not a straight no, that is still no. a work in progress. I mean, there's time between now and January, um, mm. and obviously um, Minister Woods is working through, you know, prioritisation and. and uh, quarantine. So we need to know that if we say yes, that there is a realistic chance that 
that they can come. But it's it's along with other skilled areas of workforce in, in the you know the agricultural area we're looking at it. So yesterday you will have seen that we um, have exemptions for heavy machinery operators who are working across um, horticulture. Uh, we've also got uh, several hundred. Uh, workers for our fishing industry, where that's just a workforce that can't operate the vessels otherwise. So and we vets. are working with uh, and veterinarians. So obviously, critical shortage and animal welfare issues there. So we are working closely with industry, identifying those needs and making capacity. Take a last nationals, couple. Nationals claiming that last night you said that farming is a world of the past. No, so no, yes. absolutely, that is absolutely not what I said. I said Judith Collins' view of the challenges around climate change were views of the past and that actually the farming uh, community or leaders that I've been working with are very much focused on how can we drive further value from what we do and make sure we are competitive in our export market. So my view is she was presenting an old view of farming. Um, it's changed a lot over the years. Certainly in the past it's been characterised in that way. I think it's fair to say in MMP we haven't got quite, we haven't fixated quite so much on seats in that way. Um, however, of course, we have high expectations of all our candidates to work really hard in their seats, and they do. Do you think Marshall Penny, you know, come out a few times and said he wants to be the Minister of Health, um, the new government. Have you had that conversation with the Minister? Uh, no, no, in fact I haven't discussed with any uh, of our current ministers um, what roles would look like after an election, in part because actually their job right now is to work very hard to be ministers and everything that comes thereafter is decided by voters. I think it's, look, I think it's fair to say that across education generally, um, we have been talking and working as a government to make sure that we have no barrier to every young person achieving to their full potential. And there has been acknowledgement there are issues within our education system across the board and I would not single out tertiary versus secondary versus primary. This is something we have to deal with generally. Oh, look, certainly that's what we're working very hard for. And we have candidates, um, I think, that have earned the right to be elected as the local MP. So I've worked very, very hard. And so that's, of course, what we're working for this election. Um, I would put Jamie Strange amongst those. Which electorate are you eyeing up as a potential? Oh, if, actually, I don't, uh, the, every seat we work hard for. Um, but actually, there are some that have, of course, been marginal. Uh, and with enough hard work through this election, we would hope to have uh, won through good hard work. All right, we'll finish up there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. There is a way to simplify all of those expectations. Uh, we have seen um, processes developing uh, in conjunction uh, with our farming leaders the use of farm plans. Our view is that they in the future can be used as a tool 
to remove a huge amount of administrative burden um, for our farming community. It means that in the future we should be able to remove some of the consenting processes by having integrated farm plans. It's something that the